Hey everyone, I'm Tom Bevan, co-founder and president of RCP. Welcome to this week's edition of RCP's Poll Position. We are joined today by Patrick Ruffini. He's the co-founder of Echelon Insights and also the author uh, of a recent book called The Party of the People. Patrick, thanks for joining us today. Appreciate your time. Thanks, Tom. It's great to be here. Uh, well, let's start with the book because it was released in, I guess, November and and give our our listeners and viewers a sense of, of what the book's about and why it's important heading into 2024. Yeah, I mean, I think it goes through changes uh, that we've had in our recent decades in our politics um, that have led to uh, Republicans um, now being um, more and more a party of the working class and Democrats uh, obviously doing better and better among college educated voters and suburbanites and what that really means for the future of our politics and particularly like will we see you know a future um, where uh, you know Republicans are rep do, do will represent a sort of more a more diverse multiracial coalition because you have a lot of folks as, as evidenced by some of the shifts in the 2020 election um, uh, in a lot of minority communities who are uh, members of the working class who uh, don't really align with a far left view of politics, even though they've traditionally been Democrats. So it really kind of takes a look at all those trends that have been unfolding recently and have been unfolding in some of the 2024 polling we've seen. Well, I was just going to ask, do you expect those trends to continue based on what you've seen? And, and is that a function of whether Donald Trump is the nominee or it's, I was going to say somebody else at this point, it can only be Nikki Haley. So um, what, what are you seeing heading into this election? Well, I think it's it's a, you know, I, I think in particular, like if Donald Trump is the nominee, it's a very different coalition than it would be if you somehow had a return to a, a traditional form of establishment Republican politics in the form of a Nikki Haley, which is unlike, very unlikely to happen. Um, but I think the upside of, of you know, a Trump uh, nomination would be that, you know, he does probably genuinely have a chance to do um, a good deal better among uh, Hispanics, um, better among African Americans, at least that's what the polls are showing. Um, and, but uh, the flip side of that is, you know, he continues to lose suburban voters, he continues to lose college educated voters, which, um, you know, have cost Republicans, particularly in congressional races. Um, it hasn't been as big of a, of, a, of a loss, let's say, in presidential elections, where again, a lot of those voters are, are concentrated along the coasts. Um, but um, uh, but in congressional elections, Republicans have been struggling be with some of these recent coalitional changes. You mentioned uh, a return to the re Republican establishment, and this is something that is often debated. We often debate it on our podcast as well. Is um, is is that ever in the cards? Would the will the Republican Party ever return to the the you know establishment? Uh, party that it was before Donald Trump uh, basically sort of reinvented the party, as you mentioned, as a working class party. I think we won't return to exactly what the politics of the past was, but I think it, I think it is a moving target, right? I mean, just as um, there was not uh, just as, you know, even a uh, the presidency of a George W. Bush, you know, was, uh, you know, is now seen in retrospect as this very establishment uh, type presidency, but it was far more conservative than a president's, the presidency of a Jerry Ford or a Richard Nixon. So the party has always been in flux. It's always been in motion. And, you know, I do think, you know, we could see in the future, you know, how long into the future, I'm not sure. Um, I, I don't think, you know, once Trump exits the scene, eventually, I don't think you'll have somebody who, I mean, he is unique. He is sui generis. Um, so I don't think you'll have somebody who's exactly like him. You ha you may have somebody who's sort of somewhere in between the mold of that old school Republican and and a Donald Trump. Um, but um, but I think the party is always in motion, and I don't think you know we are going back to that that form of politics exactly um, now, whether or not though. But I don't think necessarily we're going to see just as it, I mean it was hard for Republicans to recreate Ronald Reagan. It's going to be hard for future Republicans to perfectly recreate. The person of Donald Trump and and you know, his unique appeal um, to uh, the base of the Republican electorate. So, Patrick, let's get into the mechanics of polling a little bit. You've been at this for some time. You founded Echelon Insights, I think, in 2014. So, give give our 
listeners and, and viewers a sense of I mean, what are the challenges that, that you've faced and the polling industry in general has faced over time? And, and how have you gone about working every single cycle to try and, you know, address those challenges? Sure. Uh, I think that we started at a moment in time when um, there was, as there is today, uh, a large amount, a big, pretty big amount of concern about the accuracy of polling. Um, you know, I, I don't know if you remember that uh, Eric Cantor primary um, and where, uh, you know, uh, there was a 30 point polling miss in a primary and, um, you know, it was a complete and total surprise. And we started a week after that. <laughs> and so we did not decide to start the firm in, in, in response to that event. That would have been a little bit uh, crazy if we had done that. But um, it couldn't have been more perfectly timed. Um, but um, what we've seen over time is that the concerns about polling and accuracy have not gone away, right? Um, that, um, and, um, you know, you, you saw this most recently, I think, in the 2020 election, where again, um, I, I think uh, the public was not necessarily as surprised by, uh, by the results, but certainly the polls were off by a good margin in terms of what Joe Biden's ultimate victory margin would be. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think that, um, you know, to, to an extent, right, um, the, uh, you know, the polls are going to be, you know, let's say uh, the polls are going to be maybe further off, right? <laughs> Uh, in the it can be further off in, in sort of between the final polls and the results of the election, then the movement of the polls is all cycle before those final polls. Um, so, um, you know, that has been a frustration of the industry. Now, I think we've tackled it in a number of ways. I mean, I think we have, um, uh, you know, I think we've been at the forefront of the shift to online polling in a number of contexts, um, you know, with the adoption of, of uh, text-based polling too. Um, I think that the industry is find, trying to find uh, a lot of ways to adapt um, to an environment that's just getting more and more expensive too. I, I mean, it's really a cost problem on an everyday basis um, for a polling firm um, to reach people in the old gold standard ways uh, with telephone live interviews. That's just getting more expensive cycle after cycle. Fewer people are picking up the phone. So what are new we, new means we can uh, do? But um, off, a lot of times, uh, you know, we are uh, both tackling an accuracy question. We're tackling a cost question for our clients because I, I, I think that, um, they're, they're, you know, you know, there's only so many dollars to go around and they want to be able to continue to do polling, right? Um, so we don't want to see a situation where only a certain type of poll can be done and then, but polls are almost never done in that point, at that point because uh, it's just too expensive. Um, uh, you know, as far as what we, um, you know, I, I think we uh, sit really at the marriage of polling and analytics. We think that um, it, one of the reasons uh, we were among the most accurate in the 2022 cycle um, is because, um, you know, we run a turnout model on every election. Um, we figure out specifically which individuals in the electorate are likely to turn out, not necessarily in broad stripe stroke demographics, but in person by person who is likely to vote and who isn't. And the people who aren't un relatively unlikely to vote in that election, um, you know, we're not kicking them out of the survey because some of them will vote. There's some probability that we will, they will vote. And we just kind of try to balance, right? Uh, we have this concept of a likely electorate poll instead of a likely voter poll. Um, that it's not just, it's not kicking out low propensity voters entirely. It's just saying, let's have the right percentage of low propensity voters. Let's have the right percentage of mid propensity voters. And let's have the right percentage of high propensity voters. And I think in terms of the reading of the political environment, um, that question of propensity right now is a big one. Um, when, you, when you look at the special elections, um, uh, and Democrats doing pretty well in the special elections and the electorate for those races looking a lot different uh, than the electorate potentially for what a fall general election for president is going to look like. Um, and oftentimes it's, it's the reverse of the old party coalitions, right? I mean, that's part of part of a, an upshot of the changes I talk about in my book. But um, you have a, a situation, especially right now, it seems like where uh, Donald Trump would really seem to benefit um, from a high turnout election. And Joe Biden would seem to benefit from a low turnout election, which is, uh, I think, the reverse of, of what we've seen in decades past. And speaking of that, um, one of the things about Trump, who, you know, in 2016, 2020, and I expect again this time, 
you know, he manages to turn out people who who aren't high propensity voters, who sometimes haven't even voted at all, or certainly not in the last couple cycles. How do you deal with with new voters and with voters who are who who maybe don't turn out on a regular basis, but you know, when Trump is on the ballot, they end up coming into coming into play. I, I think that the real challenge is uh, this is not a waiting challenge primarily. It's a challenge of uh, getting those people on the phone because uh, low propensity voters are not just low propensity in the sense of they won't may may be, may may or not may not turn out on election day. Uh, they mean not. They're definitely if they're not turning out on election day. If there's a question of whether they'll turn out on election day. There's an even bigger question of whether they'll sit through a 10 or 15 minute conversation with a pollster. Um, and, um, you know, oftentimes the uh, sort of cut point for po- po- participation in a poll, I think, is oftentimes higher than the, just the, the than just the act of casting a ballot on Election Day. Um, so that's the challenge we deal with. And I think it's not just a simple measure of, OK, we have we have the analytics right on. Uh, we think that the certain population of a certain person is only a. Uh, you know, 20% chance to vote, but we need to include, we need to represent them somehow. So we wait to that population. But I think it's also um, just uh, uh, going out of your way to talk to those low propensity voters. Um, also, one of the things we've seen is, um, you know, in particular, I think with a lot of polls is um, just look at the Trump voting areas, right? I mean, particularly look at the Trump voting areas in 2020. Um, that um, this gets hidden in a lot of battleground polls. Um, but, um, you know, if you look at the raw data uh, from surveys um, and you just look at precincts or counties that voted, let's say, 70% for Trump, 80% for Trump, just look at what those polling margins were when you can aggregate that data. Is it 70 or 80%? It very rarely is. I mean, you really, um, it, this is really a question of missing a specific kind of place geographically in the country. And I would encourage all pollsters to really kind of take a look at their data from that perspective, from that very granular geographic level, aggregating a lot of polls together. What would you tell someone uh, outside of the horse race number, outside of like the top line, which gets all the attention, but if someone's asking, what are the numbers I should pay attention to in a poll? What would you tell them? Is it is it job approval? Is it the, you know, issues? Is it is it that some of the uh, you know intangibles that sometimes pollsters will ask those questions about leadership and, and all those things? What would you tell someone who's asking you, what's the most important thing or the second most important thing uh, that I should look at in a poll? So my job as a pollster is very rarely, I mean, I think the upshot is we take the, we, we take the idea of accuracy very seriously, right? Because we know we are publicly judged on that and we don't shy away from that. But I think there is this um, sense in the you know people who do polling for a living is, Look, I mean, particularly people who, people who engage with campaigns, um, you know, people who are, are are doing this for individual clients. Oftentimes what they're telling their clients, and I think what is true about that is, you know, we're not necessarily telling you if you're winning or not, right? Because there are all sorts of issues with trying to, you know, say, all right, we're going to get this the ballot exactly right within a point or two, right? That is um, a tall ask for a lot of people. We are telling you how to win, right? Regardless of exactly where you stand right now, um, uh, we are um, telling, you know, we are uh, testing messages um, and arguments that you might use. We're testing your opponent's arguments against that to see which argument, you know, ultimately comes out on top. Who's the winner? You know, if, if we say this and your opponent says that, and that is... You know, I would say 80% of a poll that you would do for an internal client. But I think from a lot of the public polls, I think, first of all, the public polls would actually do well to try to actually ask some of those questions the way a campaign pollster would. Because I think it would help people far better understand what the value of a poll is and why the polling industry exists in the first place. Um, because it's not, uh, it's not a charity operation for media or for readers to figure out, you know, who's ahead or who's behind. It is ultimately the reason firms like ours exist is because we are trying to provide good strategic advice to our clients. So I think it would be good for the media to actually recreate and try to run some of those experiments themselves where you're presenting pro Trump messages, provide messages and seeing which ones wins out. But I think the closest thing you get is, is something specifically in that NBC News poll over the weekend that had Trump up five. So you Trump up five. But I think that the really telling statistics from that poll 
was Trump had a 22 point advantage on handling the economy. He has a 16 point advantage on competence. Um, and you look at 2020, Biden had a 15 point advantage on competence in 2020, and that's completely flipped. Whereas everything else has only moved in a, in a direction of Donald Trump by about 10 or 15 points. That That is a 30 point shift just on the question of competence. So I think done right, you know, even the public polls really can tell you, all right, it's not, yes, the horse race, but they can tell you why the horse race says what it does, what the election is about, the why behind, um, why somebody might be ahead or behind. So uh, last question here is just give us your thoughts on where this race currently stands. I mean, obviously we're still, what, 10 months away, nine months away from the election. Um, but based on what you're seeing right now, um, what what's the main issue? What's driving things? What's moving the numbers sort of behind the scenes? Sure. I mean, I think you can't help but conclude that Trump is the favorite as it stands today. Things can move pretty quickly. Um, you know, I, I think that there is always the possibility that I think the economy could improve and that gives that doesn't necessarily give Biden a chance to win on the economy, but it gives it it, it gives it a chance to it gives him a chance to tighten it such that his uh, mantra of abortion and democracy can ultimately carry the day. I think that's the thesis that the Biden White House is operating under, um, you know, but the you know, it's been frustrating, I think, for the White House generally so far, because you do see the economic uh, sentiment numbers improving, but that has not resulted in any kind of real movement on Biden's ballot numbers, which have stayed pretty stagnant over the last um, over the last few few months, um, with Trump having a pretty consistent lead uh, in at least your polling average. Right. So um, uh, so I think that you can you can you can't read this as anything but um, you know, an advan a narrow advantage for Trump right now. Uh, there's obviously a lot of unknown, specifically as it relates to, uh, you know, the criminal proceedings. Uh, but, um, but um, I don't think you can read this as anything but right now, um, a, a you know, a, a race that tilts Trump. All right, we will leave it there. Patrick Ruffini, co-founder of Echelon Insights. Thanks for joining us today. We appreciate your time. Thank you. And that's going to do it for this edition of RCP's Pole Position. I'm Tom Bevan, co-founder and president of RCP. Thanks for watching.